And a very good morning to you. My name's Joel Hufford. I'm your host for today's Ports of Water webinar on our Haven Thicket Reservoir project. Welcome along and thanks for taking the time to join us on this Friday morning. We'll get to meet the rest of the panel members very shortly. Uh, you'll see them pop up on your screen in due course. But just a quick word of explanation, first of all, about how today's webinar is going to work. Because we've got quite a few people uh, joining in, it's not feasible to have everyone on camera and with sound. It's only myself and the panel members you'll be able to see and hear from directly but don't worry there'll be plenty of opportunity for you to put your questions to us and we'll get to the details of how you do that very shortly we'll also be doing a couple of polls with you at the start and the end of the webinar to, to canvas your views as well so we hope there'll be plenty of interactivity and you have a chance to get your your queries and your concerns aired on this webinar uh, today so uh, let's move into uh, an overview of what we're going to hear about today in terms of the agenda uh, for the day so we'll find out, first of all, why the reservoir is needed in the first place in terms of the regional picture for water resources, as well as the benefits it will deliver both regionally and locally in terms of the environment and also locally for the communities uh, in and around the reservoir sites uh, for leisure. We'll talk about some updated proposals that we've put forward as part of this consultation on getting to and from the reservoir, whether that's for vehicles or for people using uh, bikes, horses or foot to get to the reservoir as well. We'll look in detail at some of the reservoir's design and construction detail, particularly the safety measures that, that are built in and give you a very good idea of what the reservoir will look like once completed. And we'll also talk about the pipeline that's needed to get water to and from the reservoir in terms of filling it up from Bedhampton Springs during the winter and then taking that water back out to supply it when it's needed as well. And of course, there'll be plenty of opportunity for you to ask your questions. So uh, let's took, look in a bit more detail at how you can do that. If you look at the bottom of your screen where we've got the red circle on the slide that's up at the moment, you can see you've got two buttons there. One is to raise your hand and one is the Q&A button. It's the Q&A button that you need to uh, pay particular attention to. So you can see it closer up there. If you hit that, you can type in a question. It will pop up on a panel in front of me and then I can put your questions uh, to the panel members as we go through. So for example, if you ask a question about um, getting to and from the reservoir and some of the access route options, we may save that question back until it's the relevant part um, of the webinar. So you can see the detail and we can answer that question in context. Uh, we might also type an answer back to you. Um, I've got colleagues working behind the scenes that may do that. And if there's anything we can't get to today because it's quite detailed or we need to go away and, and come back with the answer, we can do that after the fact as well. So there's plenty of opportunity uh, for you to ask questions. The other thing to mention is that we are recording the webinars as we go through. So you may have seen on our website, portsmouthwater.co.uk forward slash haven't dash ticket dash reservoir. If you go to the consultation uh, webinar section of that consultation site, we've got all the recordings from the webinars that we've done so far. So we did one for local stakeholders on the 12th of May, so local councillors and community groups, you can watch that. And we've done a couple of webinars for the public as well. So the recordings of that are there and the recording for this will go up on that website as well. So if you've got friends and family or colleagues that couldn't make any of the webinars, they can watch the recordings back there. Uh, but just a reminder, we have got two more webinars on the 3rd and 4th of June. And again, details on our website. So let's do the first of today's polls. We're just going to ask you a couple of quick questions about what you know about the reservoir project already and also uh, your feelings in terms of support for the reservoir project. So if I launch that poll now, it should pop up on your screen. So very simple, multiple choice answers. Question one, how much do you already know about Haven't Thicket Reservoir? And number two, do you support our plans to develop the reservoir? So people filling that in and when the polling is completed, I will share the results with you. It should pop up on the screen as well. Also, just to say, all the videos that you're going to see today throughout the webinar, they're available on our website as well. You can also find them on our Facebook page too, at Haven't Reservoir. And crucially, if you have got uh, colleagues or friends or relatives who aren't able to access the internet for any reason, they can get in touch with us via post and phone to ask for a copy of our consultation booklet and our feedback form and have their say as well. So just give people a few more seconds just to answer some of those, um, those poll questions and then I'll close the polling. So we've still got some people voting away. Uh, by the way, if people do want to get in touch via phone, we've set up a dedicated consultation phone number. That's 02392 double four nine oh eight four to leave a message give your address details we can send you the printed copy of that brochure and feedback form or just give us a question or comment so let's end the polling there 
And if I just share the results with you guys, so you can see that we've got quite a spread, quite an even spread in terms of what people know about the project already. About 37% who know quite a lot, 42% who know a little, and then there's a, a significant minority, 20% that know nothing. So uh, thank you for joining the webinar today. Hopefully today will be informative and enlightening for you. And in terms of support, um, it's going to be 70% uh, are supportive. There may have been some people who decided not to answer the question, and so they're making up their minds, perhaps after today's webinar, in terms of the information they hear today. So thanks very much for taking part in that poll there. Let's meet the rest of the panel members. So panel members, if you could just turn on your cameras and your microphones. And just a reminder, we've got lots of people on lots of different um, devices, phones, tablets, computers uh, watching today. So the way that we appear on screen may be slightly different for each of you. Uh, but if you're watching on a phone, for example, you may only see the person who's speaking. So when you guys introduce yourselves or say hello, uh, that will pop up on people's screens. So if we start with, with Bob Taylor, Portsmouth Waters Chief Executive. Hi. And we've also got, uh, we've also Sorry, got Bill John. Irvine, who's Lead Design Engineer for the project. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, we've got Trevor Codlin, who's uh, leading on the environmental aspect of the project as well. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, we'll hear from Andy Hills, particularly about the access route options for getting to and from the reservoir. Hi, good morning, everyone. And then we've got Simon Hughes, who's our environment stakeholder and planning lead for the project. So an overall charge of the planning application that will go into the councils later this year. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, we've also got Josh Newman. So he is one of my colleagues who's been working in terms of the communication and engagement around the consultation and helping out behind the scenes with today's webinar as well. Morning. And then we've got Jamie Metcalf, who we'll hear from very shortly about the leisure offering at the reservoir site in the future. Morning, everyone. Uh, we've also got Joe Farris. He's working very closely with Simon on preparing all the documentation, all the detail for the planning application that will go into Haven't Borough and East Hampshire District Councils later this year. Good morning. And we've also got uh, Jim Barker, Head of Water Resources at Portsmouth Water. Good morning, everyone. And then last but far from least, Rebecca Burgess, uh, my colleague who again works with me on the communications and engagement for the consultation and again supporting behind the scenes on the webinar. Morning. So we'll hear from all those people in further detail throughout the webinar. You can put your questions to them, just hit that uh, Q&A button, type a question in and we'll get to those in due course. We're going to start with uh, a little Q&A with Bob and with, with Simon first. Uh, and we'll be uh, getting into the rest of the detail of the webinar very shortly. Now, Bob, uh, before we start to talk about Haven Thicket Reservoir in particular and the consultation, I know there's a, an important matter that you want to give people an update on. Yeah, thanks, Joel, and um, good morning, everybody, and thanks to everybody for joining. Yes, I'm sure, particularly those of you who are local, will be aware that um, there have been police searches ongoing for some days now to try and find a missing person, Louise Smith, um, for, who, who lives in, in housing very close to the reservoir site. Um, some of you may also be aware that uh, last night it was announced by the police that a body had been found in the um, Forestry England land, which is to the north of the reservoir site. So um, that's a significant development. I don't think the, the body has been identified yet, but obviously our our thoughts and our hearts go out to the um, to the loved ones of um, uh, people affected by this this tragedy. I just wanted to um, to highlight that at the beginning that we, as 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 Portsmouth Water, are thinking about those those family members and friends who are affected by this particular tragedy. Okay, thank you very much for that update. Um, with the consultation and the project overall, uh, what's your message to people about that today, uh, tuning into the webinar? Well, I think that, that the main message is we want to hear from everybody and thanks again to everybody for taking the trouble to join in this morning. Um, you know, we do want to hear your views. We, um, we are a very uh, community minded business. We're one of two kind of uh, community minded water companies that are sort of left in, in the UK or, or community orientated, I should say. Um, and uh, we value and treasure our relationships with our local communities. And uh, as you hear, this reservoir is not a, a new idea. It's been around for some while. And throughout the, that whole process to date, we've spent a lot of time consulting with the communities and listening to people's ideas and views. And hopefully you will hear more about 
the, 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 the depth and breadth of that consultation process this morning, but we still uh, need to hear more of your views. We're about to go to, through the planning process uh, later this year. So your, your views and your ideas and your thoughts about um, what we plan to do are really, really important for us. And turning to, to you, Simon, in terms of the consultation, people may be wondering, with the impact of coronavirus stopping face to face contact and perhaps the public exhibitions that were originally planned to consult on this project, why are you still pushing ahead with the consultation with those restrictions still very much restricting daily life? Yeah, thanks, Joel. Um, so we, we discussed this at some length with um, our, our colleagues in the local planning authority, Haven Borough Council and East Hampshire District Council. And we felt that uh, it was important to uh, continue to make progress with a project that is pretty well known and understood in, in the local community. And, and I know that there's a level of um, impatience in, in communities surrounding the, uh, the site that, that uh, can, can we not just get on with it? Um, so we felt that we could design a, an approach that would allow a lot of people to get involved. And that was the most important thing was, you know, if by continuing, could we ensure that there was ample opportunity for anybody to have a say? And um, I think we've designed a, an approach that does exactly that. So, um, so yeah, so continuing with progress, with a whole range of different uh, platforms and mechanisms that you can get in touch with us and send us your ideas. Um, and we're really, really keen to hear them. Okay, thank you to Bob and Simon for now. We'll hear from both of them in further detail throughout the webinar. Let's kick off uh, the main part of the webinar today with uh, a first of a series of films that we've made, and this one is from Jim Barker, Head of Water Resources at Portsmouth Water, talking about why we need the reservoir in the first place. <laughs> So I'm Jim Barker, I'm the Head of Water Resources for Portsmouth Water and it's my job to make sure that there's enough water available to be treated to allow water to come out of everyone's taps for the next hundred years. Building a reservoir in Havant is one of the key parts of a regional water resources plan to make sure that water is available for the whole of the southeast going forward. Water companies are being asked to take less water from some sources we have available to us today, particularly from rivers, and that's in order to keep the rivers safe and healthy to protect wildlife. Plus, we need to find more water to combat the effects of climate change. We're seeing our weather patterns change. And of course, we're seeing a growing population in the southeast. So all of that adds up to the water resources in the southeast being under a bit of pressure. And this reservoir will supply extra water into the system to relieve some of that pressure. In particular, southern water, our neighbours in, in Hampshire, are being asked to take less water from two world-renowned chalk streams, the rivers test in the Kitchen. We in Portsmouth Water here, we get most of our water from the ground, from the chalk beneath our feet, and we have a series of underground springs that provide plentiful clean water to us. But as part of the South East, we want to play our role. So in winter, much of our spring water actually flows out to sea. We don't capture it and we don't, and, and we don't treat it for drinking water because people are using less water in the winter. So what we're proposing with this reservoir is actually to capture the water that is lost to the sea from our springs, to put it in the reservoir over the winters, so it's available should we have a long, hot, dry summer and, and water resources become scarce. It's really also important to say that this isn't just about finding more water. Us as water companies, and particularly as Portsmouth Water, we're doing our bit to be more effective and efficient with the water we have. So our leakage levels, for instance, are currently at their lowest level we've ever had. It's really important that we don't waste water. We're also looking to, to talk to customers about using water wisely. So in this situation of more people, climate change, less water available, we all need to think, are we using water wisely? And to take simple steps that could possibly help us all uh, use a little bit less. We've talked about the reservoir before. Plans for the reservoir, in fact, were first drawn up in 1964. Uh, but it was again in 2008 that we drew up the, the most recent plans. And at that point, we shared those plans with our customers, with you guys, during a public consultation. 
at that point, the water situation wasn't quite as stressful as it is today. So it didn't go forward at that point, but we're bringing it forward now because the situation is more stressed than it, than it was in 2008. And also the, the regional understanding of the water situation and our ability to move water around the region uh, has improved, which makes the reservoir a lot more important to more people. So right now there's a shortfall of water across the southeast as a whole and plans for the reservoir have been included in Portsmouth Water and Southern Water's long-term water resource plans as a way of looking to close some of that shortfall. So again, to remind you, all the videos you'll see today, they're available on our website, which is uh, portsmouthwater.co.uk forward slash haven't dash sicket dash reservoir. And do uh, use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen today to ask us a question. We've already had one in from Norman talking about the network of paths that we're going to put in around the reservoir site. We'll get to that in due course once we talk about the leisure side of things with, with Jamie uh, Metcalf, our colleague, uh, very soon. Uh, Jim, just to pick up on some of the detail in that film, People who've lived in the local area for some time will know perhaps that the reservoir has been talked about since the mid 1960s. The land that the reservoir uh, could be built on has been owned by Portsmouth Water since that stage. What's changed now, and especially since the last consultation on the project 12 years ago, to mean that it's, it's pretty much definitely got to happen in terms of the, the wider water resource picture? Yeah, good question. Thanks, Joel. Um, so basically, two, there's been two really big changes. One, um, the government have asked water companies to plan for a much more severe drought. So historically we've always planned for a drought or a dry weather event kind of along the lines of 1976, which was the, our, the driest in our recent history. That's roughly, we expect a drought like that about once in 80 years. The government are now asking us to plan for a drought that we might expect one in 200 years. So um, the government want more resilience in the water system, and, and finding the reservoir in the sexual water is part of that resilience. And then the other thing that's changed is back in, back in the previous um, uh, consultation, Southern Water hadn't actually been told they needed to take less water from the rivers of Tesnichin. It was just mooted. Now, actually, the Environment Agency have issued notice on them and they're not allowed to take that water. So what was a theoretical risk back then is now actually a reality today. So again, we need to find that extra water to help them supply water to their customers. And in terms of that dynamic, the reservoir uh, helping to meet a need that is Southern Waters further west in Hampshire, um, people will be saying, well, what's that got to do with Portsmouth Water and its customers? Um, because that's quite an unusual setup in terms of a reservoir that will be built and operated by Portsmouth Water, ultimately to benefit a, another water company just next door. Absolutely, but this is about the bigger picture in the southeast. So across the whole of the southeast, population density is rising, and actually there's no new water available, um, and, and water is relatively scarce. So we're fortunate that we have our spring system, as I described in the video, and actually over winter we don't fully use our spring system. So this, this is about capturing that water we can use and actually sharing it with our neighbours who don't have that luxury. Okay, great. Thanks to Jim for now. And again, Jim is here to answer your questions. Do get in touch with us via that, uh, that Q&A button at the bottom. And just to remind you, all the feedback that we get from the webinars, through the public consultation website, through the um, hard copy feedback forms that we get in, questions and queries and concerns that people raise, all that goes into informing our planning application for the Reservoir Project, which goes into Haven Borough Council and East Hampshire District Council later this year. And again, when that application goes in, you guys out there have a further chance to comment on those more finalised proposals. So we've heard about the need for the reservoir. Let's hear about the reservoir itself and some of the engineering that's involved. Here's our lead design engineer, Bill Irvine. My name's Bill Irvine. I'm lead design engineer on the Haven't Thicket project. My role on the project is to coordinate all of the design elements across the project, including the reservoir itself, the pipeline, the pumping station, and downstream treatment works and connections into the network, providing water across to Southern Waters region. The proposed site for the reservoir has been owned by Portsmouth Water since 1965 and covers 160 hectares. It sits next to Rowlands Castle and Lee Park and is bordered to the north by Forestry England Woodland at Haven Thicket, 
and Staunton Country Park lies to the south, which is owned by Hampshire County Council. The area is currently grassland and open space with areas of trees. The site has been chosen as perfect place for a reservoir because it sits in a valley on clay soils, which provides a natural seal for water. This means we'll be able to dig and shape the reservoir, predominantly using the existing material on the site. The reservoir would fill the majority of the site, it will be up to 18 metres deep in places, and it will be about one mile long from east to west and half a mile wide from north to south. The water will be contained by a sloping embankment, which will run along three sides of the reservoir and up to 20 metres high in places, with a new wetland habitat area created along its northern edge. The embankment will be mainly constructed from clay, soils excavated on site, but we will need to bring some material to site for drainage and for the internal lining. The embankment will have a grass covering on the outer slope and a rocky surface lining the embankment at the water's edge, protecting the structure from waves. We've looked at the position and design of the embankment and made a number of alterations to avoid the hedges near the western boundary of the site and slight realignments to reduce the number of trees that will need to be taken out at Roundwood and the Avenue, both of which are ancient woodland. This includes increasing the space between the western boundary and the embankment, making the southwestern edge slightly straighter and shortening the eastern bank. We've also looked at making slopes slightly steeper in places to reduce the land required to build the embankment and minimise tree loss. We will need to build a control house on the southwestern section of the embankment and a new access road as well. And the options for these routes will be discussed separately by my colleague Andy Hills. When full, the reservoir will be able to hold about 8.7 billion litres of water. That's enough to supply 160,000 people during an average year. It will take nine years to plan, build and fill the reservoir. Everything is scheduled to be complete and the reservoir full of water and open to the public by 2029. We're aiming to have achieved planning permission to enable us to start on site with enabling works through to 2023, creating the access road, preparing the site and diverting footpaths. From 2023, we can then commence construction of the embankment and reservoir itself, digging out the clay and building the reservoir. We'll also be laying the pipeline to transfer water from the pumping station at Bedhampton up to the reservoir itself. From 2027, we can start to construct the amenity provisions on site, including new pathways, a visitor centre and facilities. All works should be finished by 2029. So we'll hear from Bill in further detail in just a second. Just a reminder, we have got further webinars. So if you found this webinar useful and want to recommend it to your, your friends and family or your colleagues, we've got another one on the 3rd of June at two o'clock and then another one on the 4th of June, which is a Thursday at six o'clock in the evening, trying to spread the dates and times so that, that people can fit it in around whatever they're up to, whether it's work or otherwise. Also keep your questions coming in. We've had another question in about the leisure aspects of the reservoir, which we'll get to very shortly uh, from John. So uh, do keep those coming in via the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, Bill, just turning to you and some of the detail that was covered in that, that, that video about the reservoir design. Can you talk about some of the safety measures that are going to be built into the reservoir, both in terms of its design and its operation? Um, sure. So um, the, the design and, and construction of, uh, of reservoirs um, in the UK is, is very highly regulated. So um, we, we have to be uh, very careful um, drawing on sort of best practice and, uh, and learning from you know, over the years, drawing on expertise, um, in, in designing such uh, such structures, uh, and all of that is is overseen um, by uh, Government Act, the the Reservoirs Act 1975. Um, that requires that all um, design and construction is overseen by uh, a qualified uh, and experienced um, what's called a panel engineer, uh, and these are uh, yeah, highly qualified and experienced individuals that um, are appointed under the uh, under the Act. 
um, and they ensure that you know we're doing the right thing in terms of um, getting that getting that design appropriate um, and that the construction is 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 undertaken in in a safe manner as well uh, and then once the uh, the embankment and the reservoir is um, is constructed um, and it's in operational use um, it's signed off certified as um, uh, as as um, a safe uh, and then it undergoes a uh, regular inspection program uh, and maintenance uh, and Portsmouth Water will have an obligation to, to act on any recommendations that are made from those uh, inspections uh, to make sure the, uh, you know, the reservoir is, uh, is maintained uh, and safe in, in, in the long term. And just in terms of one particular issue that I know has, has been raised a number of times by people who've been getting in touch with us either via email, letters, uh, or via our Facebook page as well, is around the flood risk. They're looking at the reservoir next to Lee Park, next to Rowlands Castle, 8.7 billion litres of water. In terms of, of the flood risk, can you talk a bit about how the reservoir is, is unusual in terms of how it operates? Yeah, sure. So... Um... I think many reservoirs, uh, what we call impounding reservoirs, um, uh, are capturing water from an existing watercourse, a river, or, 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 um, or streams, um, and that's where they get the water from. Uh, I haven't thick it. Um, I think, as as Jim uh, sort of touched on uh, earlier, uh, is is capturing spring water down at, at Haven and Bedhampton, um, and then being pumped up. So, so while we do have some streams on site, they're they're quite small. Uh, the vast majority of the water that's um, that, that's stored in in the reservoir is is actually pumped up. So so we will have full control uh, on the waters that um, are, are sent up to to the reservoir. And equally, um, we've got the ability to um, uh, to empty the reservoir, draw down, um, uh, and obviously under operational use, we're we're using that water to. Um, uh, to, to provide uh, additional resources uh, across the region um, to, to provide southern water customers. Um, but if we did need to drain down um, the reservoir in the very unlikely uh, event of, of any issues, um, then we control that, um, that rate of discharge into, um, into, the, uh, into the streams. Um, that effect has been um, modelled uh, and, uh, and investigated, uh, so we understand that um, that effect uh, that that will have, um, and all of that is scrutinised by the Environment Agency. So we're very, working very closely with them to make sure that we're not you know, likely to cause any additional issues to um, uh, to the catchments that we're feeding. Okay, great. Thanks to Bill. We've got plenty of questions coming in, a lot of them around the leisure side of things, and we will get to those in due course. Also as well, uh, if there's any that we can answer via type and answer back to you, we will do that. And if there's any we can't answer today, we will get back to you as well after the fact. Let's move on to the next section of the webinar, though, and talk about the environmental benefits that the project could have both locally and regionally. And here's an update on that from Trevor Codlin, our principal ecologist. My name is Trevor Codlin, leading on biodiversity side of the project. We have always maintained that this is a, an environmentally led project and although the, the habitats on site will change quite dramatically, we are committed to delivering something really special to replace what, what is already there. We have been surveying the site since 2005, so we have a good understanding of the ecology of the site. We've recorded 13 species of bat, we've got um, reptiles on the site, breeding birds and also uh, dormice. And our mitigation and compensation strategy in, involves doing some quite significant enhancements to the Forestry England site to the north, which is Haven Thicket, and, and also doing some enhancements to the south in, in areas of land that we own. One of the, the key things that we, we want to deliver, and this is a really exciting bit of the project for me, is the delivery of a new wetland. The plan is to have an area of wetland along the northern edge of the reservoir. So this will be approximately a kilometre long. What we're going to have is a retaining bund which will separate the, the, the sort of main water body from this wetland. And then we're going to create four different wetland compartments which will provide a different range of habitats for different species.
There are four areas of woodland on the site. We've looked at various options as to how we might save those areas of woodland because through the consultation process with our partners, which include Forestry England, Natural England, Environment Agency and the Hampshire Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust, we, we talked about whether or not it'd be possible to provide three or two smaller reservoirs rather than one large water body and, and try and save the avenue. But unfortunately, there, there are two reasons why that can't happen. One is the best clay is located underneath the avenue. And the second is that if you did that, you then end up in a situation where you don't have enough water to address the needs for the future, for water supply for the future. The site is going to change, as we said. So what we're looking at doing is, is um, doing some extensive work to improve the quality of the woodlands in Haven Thicket to the north. And then we've also set up a grant scheme and that capital grant scheme will provide some funding for conservation projects. So we're looking at identifying suitable sites where we would fund the planting of trees in those areas. So Trevor Codlin there with an update on the environmental benefits the reservoir project uh, will deliver. Uh, we've got some questions coming in, mainly around the leisure side of things. So the questions that have come in from uh, Norman, I've also had one in from Karen, from Peter, from Andrew and from John Paul and from Bridget. We'll get to those in due course. Don't worry about that. And just also to say all the feed that feedback that we get via the webinars and via the wider consultation, as well as that helping to shape the planning application that will go into the councils later on this year. We're going to publish a report later in the summer basically a, a you said we're doing type report that will summarize all the feedback that we've heard and how we're responding to it so you'll get a clear idea of what's been said during the consultation what views have been expressed what concerns have been expressed and how we're going to address them in the planning application and when it goes in of course as with any planning application you have a chance to comment on it and find out more about it too so let's carry on with our updates on the environment and the reservoir project uh, here's an update from our colleague uh, liz brown who's been doing some detailed work around the environmental impact assessment for the scheme Hello, I'm Liz Brown. I'm the Haven't Thicket Reservoir Project's Environmental Assessment and Design Lead. Haven't Thicket Reservoir is going to create a valuable new wetland, woodland, parkland habitats, a visitor centre with parking facilities and a network of trails and paths. We have to take into consideration the impacts of any construction on the surrounding environment. So what we've been doing is we've been carrying out an environmental impact assessment for the scheme. This assessment identifies the environmental effects of the project and develops mitigation to avoid, reduce or offset these environmental effects. The assessment approach, our methodologies, have all been discussed and agreed with the local authority, East Hampshire District Council and Havant Borough Council. The environmental assessment includes inputs from a number of environmental topics. These include air quality, biodiversity, historic environment, landscape and changes in view, noise and vibration, population and health, transport and water. And that's in relation to water quality, water resources and flood risk. We've undertaken a number of surveys and studies. Most importantly, Portsmouth Water anticipated that a lot of survey work in terms of biodiversity would need to be done. But this means that surveys have been undertaken recently and reported on in terms of European protected species, but other habitats as well. In addition, we've done a ground investigation, which is informing the assessments about ground conditions and the amount of material that might be generated on site, which can be used during construction. And we've also been doing traffic surveys to ascertain traffic numbers in the local areas to inform our assessment. But the advantage of having this baseline information means that we have up-to-date current information and then we can then consider the, the, the changes that might happen as a result of, this, of the project.
as our design develops further, we will be developing a, a detailed environmental plan for construction. Now, this is for both the pipeline and the main reservoir itself. We prepare an outline of this as part of the planning application. This will indicate how we will keep any impacts, such as noise from traffic or construction activities, to a minimum as we are working. This plan will be agreed in advance with the relevant local authorities and the measures it includes will be applied throughout the construction. For example, a traffic management plan will help reduce disruptions such as restricting construction traffic to certain routes and times of the day. If you want further details on the work that Liz has been beavering away on in terms of the environmental impact assessment and the progress made to date, if you go to our website, portsmouthwater.co.uk forward slash haven't dash sicket dash reservoir, you can read more details there in the environment section. You can also uh, download a copy of our consultation booklet that's got more details in, or you can get in touch with us uh, and we can send you a copy as well. Uh, details of that to follow. We've got Trevor Codlin and Simon Hughes with us. We've got uh, quite a few questions coming in guys um, about the environmental side of things uh, but Trevor first of all could I just start with asking you about the wetlands because I think that may strike people as unusual to have in a reservoir can you just talk a little bit about why that's being planned in and the benefits it could have yeah so the obviously the, the, the project itself is going to be losing some areas of woodland and, and those woodlands are, are designated as as ancient woodland and so we recognize um, that that's a you know a significant loss and so we wanted to do something that was going to be really special to replace the, the habitats on site so rather than being extensively grassland it's going to be a large water body and so by creating a wetland along the northern edge um, that provides a sort of sanctuary area for coastal birds. Um, we're only three kilometres from the designated coastal site. Um, it could provide um, breeding habitat. It could provide, you know, roosting areas. But also, it's for sort of other other aquatic invertebrates. You know, we, we are losing some watercourses. These are ephemeral streams that flow through the site. And so, it's, it's just trying to to come up with something that that could be very special in the future. And, Okay, thanks to Trevor. And uh, Simon, a question to you from Andrew Wyatt. Uh, so he's talking about what's the difference between the high and the low water levels in the reservoir? Will extensive mud flats emerge when the reservoir is at its lowest level? And could that be unsightly? And he also talks about the stone facing inside of the embankment being made to look more attractive. So first of all, the, the first point around the variability yeah. in water levels in the reservoir. Yeah, so um Thanks for that question. Um, that's, there's a lot wrapped in there about how the reservoir actually operates and the way we expect to use the reservoir is that actually it's, um, it's saving water for a dry day. So on a day to day basis, although you may want to circulate the water to keep the water fresh and move it around, actually the level on a day to day, week to week basis won't change that much. When it is used, you would ex it would be during a time that you would expect it to be used. So warm, dry weather following a period of dry winters is, is the times when we're most likely to use it. And that doesn't happen every year. That happens, you know, sort of once every 10 to 20 years. When it is operated, um, the, the, the level can, can drop significantly, um, although that would be quite rare. And you will begin to see the, uh, the rock uh, armoring a bit more. So in the rock armoring, we're planning to create some areas that uh, plants can become established so that, you know, it, it softens the edges slightly, but also nature is fantastic at making the most of those sorts of uh, habitats. And we'll find all sorts of plants and insects growing and birds foraging through um, the, uh, the, the, the rock, um, the, the rock armoring. And, you know, that's, unlikely to be big chunks of rock it's sort of um big enough to to dissipate the energy from the waves but not the sort of thing you'd see on um you know on the kent coast flood defenses for example 
Okay. Uh, we've got another question in from John Paul Rogers, again, perhaps for you, Simon. Uh, has any research been done into the effect the large surface area of water will have on the surrounding area? He's interested to know about what the benefits may be in terms of effect on air temperature, local climate, that kind of thing. Yeah, thanks, John. That's, um, I spotted that question coming in. That's a third, that, I've not seen that one before. Um, but it is a question that's been asked about other reservoirs across the country. Um, I think the short answer is there hasn't been a huge amount of work done in this, not just on this project, but any other project. Um, the long answer is there are some very small discernible impacts in terms of temperature. So you'll know if you, if you stand by a colder or cooler um, water body and the breeze is blowing towards you, it does, it does feel a little fresher and a little cooler. Um, it, it might seem like a big piece of water when we look at the photographs, but actually it, in sort of um, terms of what can affect the microclimate, it's not that big. So actually the, the, the greater impact is sort of the quality of the woodland and um, the prevailing breeze is gonna have the biggest impact on what you discern when you're, when you're on the side. But you know, on a very, very hot day, you might notice that it's slightly cooler there. Okay, great. Thanks to Trevor and Simon for now. Do keep the questions coming in. We've got loads of questions about leisure facilities at the reservoir site, so we'll get to those in due course. First of all, let's get an update on our proposals for that particular issue. First of all, from our uh, lead landscape architect, Jamie Metcalf. I'm Jamie Metcalf and I'm the Haven Thicket landscape architect. I am tasked with designing the external spaces at Haven Thicket in order to create somewhere special for everyone to use. For the local people, Haven Thicket Reservoir will create an exciting new leisure facility and wildlife conservation area for local communities on their doorstep. We want to provide a place for people of all ages to stay healthy, learn more about water and nature, and to get together as a community. We also want to support local wildlife to thrive. So we've worked closely with the local community to understand people's views and develop proposals that reflect these. We're also working closely with our neighbours at Staunton Country Park and Forestry England's Haven Thicket site to make sure our plans work together and support each other. This is our overall plan, which is shaping our proposals. It includes a new wetland habitat on the reservoir's northern edge that's discussed in detail in our video on the reservoir and the environment. Our plan also includes a visitor centre with cafe, shop, community and education spaces, parking facilities, play and picnic areas and a network of trails for walkers, cyclists and horse riders. So on the site, the visitor centre will be set in the landscaped area with parking, play areas and picnic sites connecting visitors with the wetland and the surrounding woodland. A wetland boardwalk will run from outside the visitor centre to the nearby bird hide. This will be amongst reeds next to the water, which will encourage visitors to get closer to wildlife on the site and learn more about it. A network of nature trails will lead from the centre for walkers, joggers, cyclists and horse riders. The plan is to replace the existing bridleway with a five kilometre circuit around the site with access points for people living nearby. A shorter one kilometre trail through the woodland will provide an alternative for visitors who want to stay closer to the cafe and car park. Benches, bins, viewing areas and information boards will also be located all around the reservoir. We've been working closely with local councils, environmental groups and other companies who manage similar sites to explore ways to create a great place for visitors, as well as a peaceful home for the wildlife. We've also been talking to local communities, walking groups and cycling and horse riding representatives to understand all your needs. We plan to provide parking for just under 200 cars in the northwest corner next to the visitor centre. There will also be an extra 75 spaces in an overflow car park with occasional use. We want the car park to have a natural feel with native trees and shrubs and paths leading to the woodland. This will also make it easier for wildlife to travel through the car park area. The car parking will also include spaces for staff, disabled visitors and coaches, as well as cycle racks and near the time we'll look at how many electric charging points we'll need. The overall parking space numbers are based on the amount of people we expect to drive to the site. They were worked out in a review carried out last year by a company which specialises in public attractions. 
Based on the medium level of activities we plan to offer. If we offered more activities, we would need to plan for more visitors to the site. There will be charges for car parking and these will be set in consultation with Hampshire County Council to make sure they align with charges at other nearby sites such as Staunton Country Park and the Forest Ringlands Haven Thicket Woodlands so that car parks can support each other. We'll be encouraging as many visitors as possible to leave their cars at home and walk and cycle to the reservoir as well as make use of local transport like buses and trains. We want to work with local authorities and travel companies to integrate the reservoir into the local public transport network. So Jamie Metcalf there with an overview of the potential leisure facilities at the reservoir site. Don't forget, if you go to our website, our consultation website, and click on the leisure page there, there's a very neat feature where you can leave your ideas around leisure activities. It's almost like a, a virtual post-it board where you can write down your comment, put it up there, and then we can have a look at it. We've had all sorts of questions around other activities at the site other than what we're proposing that we're, we're looking at in detail as well. So do give us your ideas for that. In Jamie's video, you got a glimpse of the visitor centre and the draft design for that. Let's look at that in a bit more detail now with our lead architect, Kieran Dyer. I'm Kieran Dyer. I'm the architectural lead for the Haven Thicket Reservoir project and my main remit is to look after the buildings that are part of the reservoir development, mainly the visitor centre and the public realm. The visitor centre is such an exciting part of the overall scheme. Really it's going to be a public face, the, the touch points of the public are going to come and uh, come and see about the reservoir and the development. It has to blend into the natural landscape of the reservoir and the wetlands and we're looking to maintain that rural character, particularly for the use of sort of natural materials to uh, connect people with water. So we're looking at a waterfront location for the, the visitor centre um, to really provide that experience and connection for visitors. So the visitor centre is going to have several facilities, a key one being the, the reception area where visitors will be able to get information about the water, wildlife and activities um, that's happening around the whole reservoir. There will also be a large open plan cafe um, which will have panoramic windows which will give you views across to the wetlands and the different habitats. There's going to be an external terrace as well. Uh, which will be just off the cafe that will have some overflow for another 50 people. There's also going to be a small little shop which will sell local products and artwork. Uh, there's also going to be an education and community space. You know, it's going to be a nice flexible area um, with a separate outdoor space, uh, cloakroom and toilets as well. And really we need to provide sufficient space for staff and volunteers. So it's going to be an office and break room for them as well. The visitor centre has to be designed for a broad range of people. We're looking at accessible users, dog walkers, uh, cyclists, runners, family groups and community groups. So really the visitor centre has to suit all their needs and, and that's our challenge. We'll work up the plans to the outline planning permission. Following that, we will work with local stakeholders and community groups uh, to develop the designs further into something more detailed. So that's our initial update on the leisure offering potentially uh, at the uh, reservoir. So let's talk to Jamie and to Simon about that in a bit more detail. Guys, I have to say, we've got loads of questions that have been coming in on this particular topic. So we'll try and rattle through them as quickly as possible. So be comprehensive in your answers, but on, on the brief side, if you can. And let's start off with a good question from, from Peter Taylor, who asks, what number of visitors are you anticipating at the medium level of activity? So, so what would that look like in terms of footfall across, across a typical year? 
So for that medium level of activity and the amenities that we're providing within the site, we're expecting uh, 318,000 visits per annum. 318,000 visits, was it? Yeah. Okay, and that's what's gone into determining um, the overall facilities, the car parking, all that, all that kind yes, of stuff. Yes, this has had a, a full on then for the size of the car parking and the amenities that we provided, yes. Now, that may sound like a very high figure uh, to people, particularly those living in the local area who may be concerned about traffic. What's that based on? Is, is it based on other similar facilities? So you've got a, a real world example to work from? Yes, yeah, so these uh, independent uh, advisors took on board all the kind of uh, recent reservoirs, um, lake amenity areas that are similar to what we're providing. Okay. Uh, Simon, uh, I've got a, a couple of questions that I think um, you could pick up. Um, what decisions have been made already about amenities and leisure facilities, i.e. what is it that we can still influence as part of the consultation process? And again, that's coming from Peter. Hi, Peter. Thanks. Um, just, to, just on the visitor number thing, uh, George, should we leave that? Um, you might be surprised to know that we've uh, counted um, around about 93,000 visits per annum to the site as it stands. So um, it's already a pretty heavily used um, site, as, um, as, as most of you will know if you're local. In terms of the amenities, look, we want to hear from you. Um, we want to hear what's important to you and um, what, um, you know, what you'd like to see. There are some um, things that we have ruled out at the moment for uh, sort of safety operational reasons. Um, that includes uh, wild swimming, so again, uh, the reservoir is a deep, um, cold um, operating reservoir. And as I said before, you know, we'll be, we'll be moving water around it um, with, with very little notice. So um, in order for us to be able to fulfill our duty of care to people visiting the site, we, we're not at this moment proposing to um, allow wild swimming. In terms of boating, we're suggesting that um, you know, the, the, the reservoir's got to work quite hard in terms of being a, a very good place for nature and a place for quiet enjoyment of the countryside with educational benefits. Um, and also we don't want to attract too many visitors into the site. Um, and so at the moment we felt that because of the provision for, for boating around the area is so good, we, we wouldn't encourage or, or build any um, facilities for boating on, on the site. Okay, great. Uh, Jamie, a question for you that's coming from Norman, and I guess it's in the context of the current restrictions uh, on uh, you know, daily life across society. Will your paths support social distancing? So I guess Norman's question has an element of future proofing the site in terms of the network of paths. Yeah, very relevant question currently. Um, so our path widths are uh, approximately four metres wide. So uh, keeping that two metres social distance should be achievable. Um, but uh, the government has just recently released some guidance on uh, social distancing measures within urban environments and green spaces. And we'll be looking to incorporate this as well. OK, we've also had another question, perhaps for you, Jamie, from John Paul Rogers. It's about picnic and play areas. Uh, he says that they're shown near the visitor centre, but he would like them uh, around the site, perhaps on the Staunton Country Park side, so that you can still have a picnic, take the kids to a play area, but not necessarily go all the way to the visitor centre from the other side of the site. Yeah, another great question. Um, so picnic areas are currently shown within that northwest corner, but there are other kind of amenity uh, spaces as well. So in the, the southwest, there's this viewing area, which will provide, again, seating for people as they're going around the circular walk. Um, along the, the lower half of the embankment as well, there could be some breakout spaces available for those with uh, uh, picnics as well. And then also at the top of the avenue staircase, there's another lookout area. So we are trying to incorporate as many amenity facilities as possible um, within the site. Okay, and, and don't forget, you can go to the website, you can fill out our feedback survey online, you can put a suggestion on that, that, that post-it board that I talked about. I want to hear your ideas about leisure in particular. Uh, Simon, another question for you, again from, from John Paul. He says, I'm a local architect with a keen interest in sustainable design for the buildings. Are there aspirations to create fully sustainable buildings, exceeding the basic building regulations and gain accreditations? For example, yeah. solar power, rainwater harvesting, uh, renewable and low impact materials, the list goes on. Green roofs even. Great, uh, thanks John Paul. What a, what, a great, um, what a great career to have. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. So we're currently looking at BRIAM accreditation, which um, for those of you who don't know is, uh, 
is an independent environmental standard for um, sort of public use and, and office buildings. So we're, we're discussing with Briam and advisors at the moment about the level of uh, accreditation that we secure from that. Fully intend for this to be a very water efficient uh, building as you'd expect from a water company, um, but also exploring all the opportunities for renewable energy on site, um, including photovoltaic cells, um, ground source heat pumps and so on, um, and use of uh, some of the materials that we've got available on site. So we, we would be creating a lot of timber um, and we'd really like to use um, as much of that timber as we can, reuse that um, in the buildings that we create. The, the detailed designs for the buildings are a way off yet. So um, we'll be getting into that in the next uh, four or five years. Okay, great. And Jamie, one final question briefly for you for, from Karen Sikera. We're going to answer it in two halves, the reason it will become apparent. If you can answer the second half, and Karen's wondering about footpath access from the Roland Castle uh, end of the site. Yeah, um, so the access points from the Roland Castle kind of side will remain unchanged. Uh, we are looking to um, improve the access from uh, the roundabout on the B2149 right. in terms of having a safer access for horse riders right. and those accessing the bridleway coming into the site. Okay, that's great. Now, the other half of Karen's question was around road access from Rowlands Castle. And on that topic, let's hear from our colleague Andy Hills, who's been looking at the options for getting to and from the reservoir, both during construction and in the longer term. Hello, my name's Andy Hills. I'm the senior engineer on the reservoir project who's been leading work on the options for the access route to and from the site. We need to create a public road for vehicles to get in and out of the reservoir site. That's both whilst the reservoir is being built and when it opens to the public. Options for the access road were last looked at back in 2006 to 2008. Since then, the local area has changed, so we think it's important to look at all the options again. There's more development to the southwest of the site, and there's planning permission for a residential and mixed-use development just to the north of the site. These and other plans for development mean there are new challenges and opportunities to consider. We've carried out another review of all the options and we'll continue to review and develop new ones. Each option was assessed in terms of impact on the environment, engineering and construction and how it fits into the overall aims of the project. Our review has shown that there are now two potential access points to the reservoir from the north and from the south. A number of routes from the north were considered during the public consultation in 2008. The preferred one came from the A3M Junction 2 via the B2149. At this time, this was supported by most people because it was close to A3M and avoided residential areas in Warren Park and Rowlands Castle. From the B2149, 200 metres new access track will be needed through Woodland and then the road will continue on an existing Forestry England track in Haven Thicket to reach the reservoir. There were and still are concerns about the impact of more traffic on the B2149. As we've studied the reservoir in more detail over the past few months, We've been able to make changes to the design of the embankment and this has created more space on the southwest side of the site. This has enabled a southern option to be developed. We can now build the embankment, a southern access route and a separate path for walkers, cyclists and others. This means we can create an access point from the south, either instead of or in addition to a northern one. This access point would come off Swanmore Road and follow a new road on the site along the west side of the reservoir and up to the car park and visitor centre. We're considering what routes may be available for construction vehicles and visitors to reach this access point, whilst creating as little impact on the local roads as possible. We're continuing to develop and assess these two access options and are having an ongoing conversation with landowners on the routes and the highway authority to see what is possible. We think this is an important time to hear your views and those of local councillors, environmental groups and other interested organisations. So please let us know what you think. We could even consider developing two access points, 
one from the north and the south. So Karen, who asked the question before we went into that video, hopefully that's given you a lot of information on the, the access options for the reservoir, particularly for vehicles. We've got Andy with us, as, as well as Joe Farrer, his colleague, who's a bit working on the planning application that will go into Haven Borough Council and East Hampshire District Council in due course. Uh, Andy, first of all, there's a lot of information that you've looked at, a lot of options that you've looked at to, to boil it down to those, those two that we're focusing on now. And if people want to know more about the pros and cons of each option, there's a lot of information on our consultation website in terms of the pluses and minuses of each of them but I think the truth of it is there's no neat answer there's upsides and downsides to both those options and there's the potential to use them both together uh, possibly. Yes that's that's correct Joel. In answer to the question um, we've got two options that we're pursuing the south option and the, the northern option as it was described on the video. It's also probably worthwhile to note that the existing car parking facilities near Rowlands Castle on the opposite side of the road there will remain in operation as well. So depending upon your choice, if you're a local, you might use the local forestry commission parking area, or you could go up to the Northern Access if that was the one that was evolved and developed and use that one or the Southern Access. So potentially <laughs> you've got one or three options that you could use. Okay, and in terms of the planning application, which will go in in a few months' time, there's a lot of work around the access options that's ongoing in terms of traffic surveys and other analysis that will help us come to uh, um, an option that we think is the best way forward for people to, to then look at when we put the planning application in. That's correct. Traffic counts and traffic turn counts have been undertaken at various junctions and locations around the site. These have been defined in conjunction with Hampshire County Council, the local highway authority. The purpose of doing this exercise is to understand the volumes of traffic they're currently using the roads and their behaviours as well. These would be modelled together with other anticipated traffic coming from the site in terms of construction traffic and operational traffic, and also in terms of the other developments that are taking place in the vicinity, such as land east of Horndean. All these will be assessed in the model and a kind of cumulative impact will be derived and that will be developed into a document called the transport assessment which will be used to support the planning application. We'll also be looking as part of that at the various mitigation measures and options that we have to reduce the impact of both the construction traffic and the visitor traffic on the local community. Okay and Joe I know we've had quite a lot of feedback around the access route options in already and I guess the point you would make is it's important for people to have their say, let us know their comments, their concerns, their queries, and we can take all that into account to shape the planning application detail that, that will then go into the public domain come the autumn. Absolutely. Um, um, and as Andy says, we've been looking at a north and a south, but also the potential of using both. Um, and I think this would be this would be quite a, a good way forward. Obviously, we have to balance the impact of the northern access and route on the ancient woodland in that area. There is an existing track and we wouldn't want to widen that um, too much. Um, and we also have to be cautious about the potential impact of traffic on the local residential community of Warren Park. If we have both accesses, it, it manages to dilute that traffic impact both on the ancient woodland and on the local community. So, so um, yes, we, we really want to know what your thoughts are on this. Um, obviously, as, as Andy said, there is also the potential to park at Staunton Country Park and also the Forestry England um, car park. And we are doing what we can to encourage people to, to arrive at the site by other means apart from a car. And um, we've got a good um, walking uh, pedestrian network and cycling network and for horse riders. So um, hopefully with, um, with all of those measures in place, it will, will really, really help to mitigate the impact on the local environment, but also on the local communities. Okay, and don't forget, if you go to our website, we've got more detailed maps of the accessory options that you can zoom in uh, Google Maps style and you can put a virtual uh, map pin in a particular area that you've got an interest in, a concern, a query. You can make your comment and ask your question there and that will all be taken into account. So we're entering the, the final stages of our webinar. Don't forget, if you have asked a question or if you do ask a question, we'll get it answered today if we can. Let's move into the final section though and hear from Bill Irvine again. And he's going to talk about the new pipeline to get water to and from the reservoir. Hello, my name's Bill Irvin. I'm lead design engineer on the Haven't Thicket project. 
My role on the project is to coordinate all of the design elements across the project, including the reservoir itself, the pipeline, the pumping station, and downstream treatment works and connections into the network, providing water across to Southern Waters region. We need to lay a pipeline to fill the reservoir in the winter from Bedhampton Springs and to take water out to supply it to you when it's needed. The same pipeline could also be used to steadily draw off water into the Hermitage stream in the unlikely event we need to empty the reservoir. During the 2008 consultation, we heard support for a pipeline route that followed the Riders Lane and Hermitage stream corridors. Since then, we've had a look in more detail at how we could lay the pipe along this route and the disruption it might cause. We've also considered new ways of laying pipe. We've looked at the engineering and how difficult it would be to build, disruption to the local community and traffic, the health, safety and well-being of the people building the pipeline and maintaining it in the future, environmental effects and sustainability, and the overall cost. As a result of this, we've slightly updated the pipeline route, which you can see in outline on this map. This route minimises the impact on communities, environmentally sensitive areas and areas of open space with trees and grass. These would be restored after the pipe is in place. Most of the pipe will be installed using an open cut method, where we dig down from the road or land, lay the pipe and then fill in the ground above it. In some places, we would tunnel underground using a pipe jacking method to push the pipe into place underground from one open cut hole. For example, under the railway line. Where we cross the Riders Lane and Hermitage streams, we can also take the opportunity to improve these watercourses. We plan the work so it can be carried out as quickly as possible and cause as little disruption to as few people as possible. Our proposals for the pipeline will be submitted as part of the wider planning application for the reservoir to Haven Borough Council and East Hampshire District Council later this year. The pipeline section will be an outline proposal and, if it's supported, we'll submit a detailed planning application with more information on construction and traffic management later on. For the detailed plans, we'll be looking at how we can limit the size of the areas we're working in to reduce disruption to footpaths, residents and local roads, stagger site activities to reduce traffic, restrict when work can be carried out, for example, not working overnight, and consider noise insulation measures. We'll speak to you again about these detailed plans to hear what you think. So that's the latest detail on our proposals to put in a new pipeline to take water to and from the reservoir. Again, go to the website portsmouthwater.co.uk forward slash haven dash sicket dash reservoir or just Google haven't ticket reservoir. It will take you to the, the same pages and you can have a look at the uh, pipeline route that's proposed in detail. Zoom right down to property level. Have a look and leave your comments via a, a digital pin on the map uh, with some questions as well. Uh, Bill, just to pick up on a question that we've had in that's come in from John Paul Rogers again. Uh, he says, I'm assuming it's going to take a very large amount of energy to pump water into the reservoir, and then I guess it would freely flow back downhill to the treatment plant. Is there any provision to use renewable energy to pump water into the reservoir? And is there any plan to produce energy when drawing water off from the reservoir? I guess with like a mini turbine that could be into the pipe as the water flows back and forth. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Thanks. See, um, in terms of, yes, pumping water, uh, it's heavy. Um, we've got to pump it um, about four kilometres up, uh, up to the reservoir. Um, in terms of, sort of renewables, um, uh, I think that what we're looking at is, is renew potential for renewables up on, up on site. So I think Simon um, mentioned a couple of things around the visitor centre there. But um, yeah, I think as well, there's been discussion about potential for 
uh, for solar um, cells up uh, up at the reservoir site. Um, one thing that we will be looking at doing uh, when we lay the pipeline um, is including some ducts um, uh, as part of that, uh, you know, making use of the, the trench that um, we're putting in. Uh, that will enable us to potentially connect up the pumping station to, to the reservoir site um, uh, and potentially provide, uh, you know, a link for, for energy there. So yeah, if there's renewables up at the, uh, the reservoir site, we can potentially link those down to uh, to the pumping station itself. Um, the other question about sort of recovering energy from uh, the gravity flows is a sort of, yeah, really interesting uh, proposition. Um, I think within the industry, this is becoming more uh, popular. Um, it is, um, you know, there are uh, instances where this, this technology is, uh, is starting to be used. Um, I think one of the constraints we do need to think about um, at the moment is the frequency that we're actually using the reservoir. So um, in principle, um, it is there predominantly for, for drought situations. Um, so in terms of drawing water back down um, uh, and transferring it further west, um, it's not going to be a regular um, occurrence. So in terms of um, those sort of provisions, we need to look quite carefully at the cost benefit um, to really understand the cost of the installation, uh, putting sort of turbines in, uh, and then actually how frequent how frequently we're going to use um, or draw waters back back down. But um, yeah, all these things, you know, we're dead keen to uh, to make sure that we've got you know sustainable um, uh, technologies and uh, and provision within the solution. Okay, one more question for you um, before we open it up to the rest of the panel. Got a few questions to wrap up. Uh, Bridget Beer asks, will local groundwater flood risk be impacted by the reservoir being built? Uh, I guess if there's a large amount of water being held somewhere, could that have some displacement effect or some runoff effect in terms of how the water may behave locally? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, it's, again, a uh, fascinating uh, question. Um, the, the principle of the, the reservoir site is that it's predominantly located within clay. Um, that's great. It provides the, the material that we need for um, construction of the embankment. Um, it's also great because it will provide uh, a, an effective waterproof seal for um, for, for the reservoir to hold the water. Um, but we are aware we've done quite a lot of ground investigation up at the site um, and we are aware that there are a few areas quite quite small um, within the site um, that do have a, a slightly higher sort of permeability or um, you know allow water to, to flow through through uh, as groundwater. Um, so at the moment we're planning that we'll seal those up so that we can make sure we keep the water in the reservoir um, uh, as intended. Um, uh, but also, you know, that, uh, that will sort of block up some, some of the flows, but it'll, uh, in terms of the natural groundwater uh, arrangement. But uh, I think the, the point to be aware of is that those are relatively um, uh, small areas um, and the existing flows are pretty small as well. So we wouldn't anticipate, you know, any, um, any changes in, in groundwater uh, risk, um, you know, I don't think they'd be noticeable at all. Okay, thanks to Bill. Uh, panel members, uh, the rest of you, if you want to switch your cameras uh, and your mics back on, uh, we've got a couple of questions to pick up. Uh, first of all, one for, for Simon from Dave Williams, who's uh, wanted to know about what um, engagement, what um, involvement has there been from the running community uh, in terms of the network of paths around the site? And again, uh, talking to cyclist groups, um, horse riding groups, etc. Uh, have runners been part of those conversations? Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, so as an ex-runner myself, I can see the, the appeal of um, what we're proposing to build. The, um, so so we've, been, we've been listening to some runners that have come along to talk to us at our um, previous stakeholder drop-ins back in um back in sort of christmas time um this uh, uh, last year um but we haven't had a, a formal contact yet so um any any ideas any thoughts from you would be really welcome um and please do put us in touch with folk uh we have been talking to cyclists um and cycling groups to uh the ramblers association um uh, british horse society equestrians uh, and others. So, um, uh, and we've also been listening to a lot of dog walkers as well, who who use the site and who's come along to uh, to some of our uh, consultation events as well. Okay, that's great. Uh, Jamie, a question for you for, from Peter again. Uh, on the car parks, uh, does this mean that the Forestry Commission car park becomes chargeable? Uh, just thinking that people might try and use this one if it remains free, based on the fact that other car parks, the new Reservoir One, Staunton Country Park, would have a charge against them. 
So yeah, another good question. Um, we've been talking to Hampshire County Council on this, uh, so we're trying to uh, get them all aligned. So we're in talks with Staunton Country Park, Forestry England as well. We're going to have a, a balanced fee across all three sites. Um, so hopefully this will be the, the, the solution. Okay, and just a reminder once again, do get in touch with us, whether it's uh, filling in our online feedback survey, going to our website and making a comment or, or raising a question there, uh, marking uh, something you've got a concern about on a map or, or, or otherwise, do get in touch with us. You can also get in touch with us via our Facebook page at Haven't Reservoir as well. And if you've got friends, family or colleagues who prefer to get in touch via post and phone, uh, those channels are available to them. The phone number is 02392 449084 and you can write to us at Portsmouth Headquarters in West Street in Habent as well. Uh, just before we go, uh, let's do another quick poll with you guys out there. So um, there was the one that we did at the start showed that there was a bit of work to do on our part to update you on the proposals to Habent Thicket Reservoir. So hopefully you found today informative. Do let us know what you think about this webinar format because it's a new venture for us. It's proved very popular in terms of the feedback that we We've had so far but all your views are welcome uh, also as well interesting to see uh, how you feel in terms of your support uh, for the project as well so if I just launch uh, the second poll should pop up on your screen very shortly so again similar questions as before the first one's changed slightly did you find this webinar useful that would be good for us to, to get a, a view on and do you support our plans to develop Haven't Thicket Reservoir uh, we'll just wait for those uh, replies to, to click through. Uh, just a reminder, Simon, just whilst people are filling in the poll, did you just want to talk about next steps? Because there's a couple of things to flag up. You said we're doing a report that will be out at the end of July. And then obviously the planning application going in uh, in sort of September time to the, to the two local authorities. Yeah, thanks, Joel. I mean, first of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joined us today um, for giving your time. Um, and for giving your thoughts to us. Uh, it's really helpful. It really helps us shape um, our, uh, our plans that, that we put forward to the next stage. And as Joel said, what we're going to do is take all of the input that we've had through this process, through this month long consultation um, time. And, um, and where we can, we'll, we'll adopt uh, the suggestions and the ideas and the thoughts you've given us. If we can't, then we'll explain why we haven't. Um, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll consolidate all of that, wrap that all up in this, um, uh, you, you said we did, or you said we're doing um, report. Now that will form part of our planning submission that then goes to um, both Haven't Borough Council and East Hampshire District Council. That will go to them in the first week in September. Um, and then you'll, you'll have another opportunity to examine the plans. You'll be able to see where we've modified them based on what you've told us. And, you know, th this, this is such an important project, not just for Ports of Water, but for the, for the wider uh, area of Havant and um, Rose Castle um, and Lee Park. And uh, it's, it's really important to us that, that you have your say in the way it's shaped and the way it's developed. So, because it's going to be, you know, if we go ahead, it's going to be there for a while. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to see where you've made your mark on it. Okay, great. Uh, so the polling is complete. Let's share the results. So did you find the webinar useful? Uh, everybody who answered said yes. So that's great. If you've got any further comments, do get in touch with us uh, via the website or you can email us. Again, the details available on our consultation website. And do you support our plans to develop Haven't Thicket Reservoir? Again, the vast majority of people, 88% of those who voted saying yes, uh, with 13% saying not sure. But again, whatever your point of view, do let us know your thoughts and we can take all that into account as we prepare uh, the planning application um, in due course come September. And again, when that detail goes in, you'll have another chance to look at it via the normal consultation process that there is uh, on planning applications. So thanks very much for your time. Uh, a reminder that if you found this helpful and you think it would be good for friends and family to join, we've got uh, two further webinars on the 3rd and 4th of June that people can sign up for via our website, the address for which you can see on the screen. You can get in touch with our uh, Facebook page as well. And again, we'll post updates on the webinars and some of the proposals we're putting forward via that. You can write to us via email, you can write to us in terms of a letter, or you can call us on that number 02392 449084. Leave a message. If you want a copy of the consultation booklet and feedback form, because that's what you prefer, we can do that for you. Or you can just tell us what you think as well. So all that remains for me to do is just to say that when the webinar finishes, you will be directed to the online feedback survey uh, on our website automatically. So if you feel comfortable in filling that in now, do do so. 
But in the meantime, have a very good rest of Friday. Enjoy the bank holiday weekend and we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much.